Just like having the right information is necessary to make solid hiring and lending decisions, being engaged in our community is important. Datafax is proud to support the positives and be a presenting sponsor of the Spark. Tate Systems is focused on protecting life and property. As a local, privately owned company, our foundation was built on providing all businesses with complete fire and security protection and infrastructure cabling. State Systems is proud to be a part of the Mid-South community and a presenting sponsor of the Spark. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance has been serving the Mid-South since 1954. We've always focused on supporting our community and believe in promoting the positives, encouraging engagement, and leading by example. Lipscomb and Pitts is proud to be a presenting sponsor of the Spark. Additional funding provided by Christian Brothers University and Baptist Memorial Healthcare. Get better with Baptist. This month on The Spark, our theme revolves around Baker Donaldson's collaboration in our community. We'll learn more about the law firm's legacy and philanthropic efforts in our city, along with some of their partnerships with local programs. We'll take a look at a community-based project focused on revitalizing neighborhoods by leveraging investments for transformation. And we'll also discuss how an institute focused on teaching, studying, and promoting civil rights for social change is also helping to provide free and low-cost swim lessons to Memphis youth. Have you ever been excited by a new idea? Inspired by watching someone lead by example? When we talk about creating change, we start by sharing the stories of everyday heroes who are making a difference in their own way so we can learn and do the same. This truth is the power behind this show, which is focused on business and community leaders that are leading by example to give back, fuel change, and create new opportunities for the Mid-South. I'm Jeremy Park, and this is The Spark. They're nationally recognized as one of the top workplaces. They have a legal history of 125 years. I'm here with the managing director for the Memphis office of Baker Donaldson, Mark Glover. And humble beginnings, starting small versus where you are today. So walk us through a, a brief history for Baker Donaldson. Well, Jeremy, the, start, the firm started way before I got there. Uh, the firm was founded in Memphis just after the Civil War, very small office. And over time, it's grown to be a 700 lawyer firm. Uh, with 20 offices around the country, still headquartered in Memphis with our largest office here with 250 employees. And 700 around the nation, correct? 700 this point? lawyers around the nation. And 30 areas of expertise and specialization? Right. We started as a firm in Memphis that was primarily corporate oriented. Uh, today we offer assistance to clients on almost every legal specialty there is. Wow. One of the things when you look at that makes you different is your focus. As we alluded to, you know, nationally recognized Fortune Magazine is one of the top 100 workplaces, which congratulations. But that's a testament to your focus on culture. Share your philosophy on, on culture and taking care of your team to then take care of the clients. Well, our, our firm is driven by client service and the clients come first in order to create an atmosphere where we can provide the kind of top-notch service to clients that we know they deserve, we feel like we have to create a culture and an atmosphere where people want to be at work and where people can be productive. So we do emphasize uh, fitness, wellness, uh, employee engagement in civic and community organizations and charities. Uh, we like to say that we all have shared values that we commit to as people while we're at work and not just as lawyers. When you talk about the focus on health and fitness, tie that in with Baker Fit. Well, our Baker Fit program is the name we give to our wellness program at work. It involves everything from what we call recess at work, where we go out and play kickball or dodgeball or get people away from their desk just to be active, to yoga at work. Uh, we have massage at work. Nice. Uh, we have weight loss challenges, even had a little Olympics while the Olympics were going on. So all of these things, they may seem small, but it's, a, it's an attempt for us to create a culture where people enjoy being at the office and feel refreshed when they're going back to their desk to deal with their client issues. And we're going to talk with one of your colleagues, Carla Peach Ryan, in just a second on the pro bono work and the reinvestment here in the community. But overall, you have a unique philosophy on that, and you actually give your team members hours and also to 100 hours in some cases that they can then work with nonprofits and groups that need some help with their legal uh, services. Talk about that that philosophy of reinvesting in the community and why that's important for Baker Donaldson? Well, this community has been good to us and so we do want to give back. We think it's our responsibility to do that. So our lawyers all uh, can have 100 hours of billable hour credit uh, for all the pro bono work they perform during the year. And even our non-lawyer staff are each given an eight hour day uh, to take off with pay to be committed to a civic or community project. 
That's great. So let's go ahead and take this moment to uh, show viewers a little bit of a day in the life at Baker Donaldson. At Baker Donaldson, we don't just care about you, we care about what you care about. We really believe that in order to serve our clients in the best way possible, we need to be in the communities, we need to be where they are. As a firm, we really allow employees in our various offices to embrace the organizations that they feel passionate about. The Baker Cares Board is a small little cube of a board that is overflowing and it's just where employees go to post pictures and information about various community service projects that we've done. Every year we vote on an organization or some cause to support. So this year our employees voted for the Wounded Warrior Project and we've had already great success. So it's really a great thing to do for your community, but it's a great team building activity and builds a lot of camaraderie. So we want to say to you, what do you care about? What's important to you? And let us help you support that. So that gives us some fun perspective on a typical day in the life of Baker Donaldson. I'm here with Carla Peacher Ryan. She's a shareholder of Baker Donaldson. And Mark Glover was talking earlier about the 100 hours, getting your team reinvesting here in the community, using your legal expertise to be able to help those individuals, families, and nonprofits. When you whittle that down, I mean, it's over a million dollars of give back for Baker Donaldson. But what does that look like at the individual level for you? Well, it can be anything from attending a clinic on a Saturday morning at the Hooks Institute, I mean, the Hooks Library. Uh, Memphis Area Legal Services runs a clinic on Saturday mornings. Um, it can be attorney for the day down at the courthouse where three hours in an afternoon. There's a homeless clinic at the hospitality hub. There's a veterans clinic at the VA offices. Um, or it can be taking on a referral from MALS or um, an entity called Community Legal Center where people take on cases for individuals and we've done everything from immig immigration, child support, uh, creditor problems. Wide variety, uh, Wide variety obviously. of types of cases. And to me, I mean, this is a great example where when you look at it, you're using your, your skill sets, your legal expertise to be able to help those that either uh, need an advocate, can't afford somebody, need some sort of support and guidance, but you're really stepping in and, and being that, that expert for them, whether they're an individual, a family, or a nonprofit. And I think, you know, whether it's a case that might last years or a nonprofit that needs some help with their 501c3 and their paperwork, all the above, you're able to help through your skill sets and give back. Talk about some of the, the, the kind of the collaborative partners. You have one with the Benjamin Hooks um, Institute for Social Change. That's a unique one. Share with us a little bit about that. Well, I'm on the board there and I do work, um, I, I'm actually currently a cor corporate fellow there. I, I spend my Fridays there and do a variety of things. We help them with licensing for intellectual property for their documentaries, pictures, and music, and that type of thing. Help them with their bylaws, reviewed uh, contracts, that type of thing. And then what about Community Lift? Community Lift is an economic and community development agency um, that's somewhat new in Memphis. And we help form, you, form them and get their 501c3s. And I kind of almost act as corporate counsel to them, review their contracts, um, help with leases, uh, any type of legal issues that come up, I, I'm available to assist with. When you look at, um, what, what advice would you give to somebody that says, you know what, I want to be involved, I want to use my skill sets. I mean, to me, you're a perfect example of using what you're good at to give back and align that strategically to be able to make a real impact. What would you tell others that say, hey, I want to do something similar, I want to give back in my skill set, what would you tell them based on your experience? Um, it's not hard. Memphis is a great place. It's easy to get plugged in. Uh, there are a variety of organizations that need help. Um, pick up the phone. You can find somebody that needs what you have to give. Well, I greatly appreciate you coming on and not only sharing a little bit about what you do here in the community of Baker Donaldson, apart from the legal side, um, but really to reinvest here in our community. You're, you're a true catalyst and I greatly appreciate you coming on the show and sharing. Thanks for having me.
Leveraging Investments for Transformation, Lift, Community Lift. I'm here with the president, Eric Robertson, and founded in 2010. Give us some perspective on Community Lift overall. Community Lift is a community and economic development intermediary that was born out of a citywide planning process that was led by two foundations, the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis and the Assisi Foundation, along with the City of Memphis, to rethink the city's approach to redeveloping distressed communities uh, in the city. Uh, and within that plan, it had a recommendation to create some infrastructure to support the community development industry and improve neighborhood revitalization as a whole. Uh, that uh, recommendation was for the creation of something called an economic and community development intermediary, and LIFT is that organization. They were smart enough to say that organization would then also be the bearers of that plan that would carry it forward, and so we worked toward implementing that plan so it's not something that sits on a shelf. And there's two layers to this. There's one where you're strategically focused on being stewards of resources and using those in the best means possible, but also, too, being an advocate for outside dollars to reinvest in neighborhoods, too, correct? Absolutely. Uh, Intermediary is charged with doing several things. First, attracting national resources and then channeling those resources uh, while simultaneously trying to pull local resources to be matched with those national resources and, and, and then channeling them again in a strategic way. And so on your end, you're dealing with small dollars that can be catalysts to create change, but you're also dealing with obviously larger dollars as well, focused on larger efforts. Give us an idea of some of the things, because I know one of them is under $500, but using those to be able to spur on new ideas. Sure, so there, there's a program we have called the Uplift Grants, where they are sm small $500 grants to get to that grassroots activist in the community who has been doing cleanups or planting trees or plants, uh, but how can we help empower them and engage their residents uh, or their fellow residents in small projects. Nice. Uh, then we have a, a program called River City Capital, which is an affiliate organization where we actually provide loans to businesses if they locate in our communities. Uh, one of our first loans was to a microbrewery called Wiseacre. Yeah. We provided a, a, a small loan to them to help them in uh, opening that business on Broad Avenue, which is within the Binghampton community that we serve. Nice. And talk about how music plays a piece of this too. Well, absolutely. For each community, uh, we try to find those things that are unique and uh, are uh, authentic and an asset. And so in the Soulsville community, obviously music uh, is a unique asset and it's authentic to that community. Uh, with the help of the University of Memphis City and Regional Planning Department, we've developed a strategy called the Memphis Music Magnet, which uses music as a catalyst for revitalizing that neighborhood. Uh, and uh, to begin to implement that, the first phase of that has been something called the Memphis Slim Collaborator, or what we call the Memphis Slim House, which is a place for musicians to first gather, uh, to have rehearsal space, uh, and then if they wanted to record a demo, they could also do that there. Nice, so let's go ahead and let's show viewers, take them on a journey of the Memphis Slim sure. House. Let's do it. Memphis Slim was a blues musician that played here. This was his dad's house. Slim House is in Soulsville, which is right across from Stax, so um, there's a huge music community. It was completely restored and renovated and turned into a recording studio for up-and-coming musicians. The house is built so that it is soundproof and downstairs we have uh, a C4 recording console. We've got a drum set, your basic PA system so people can come rehearse and also record at the same time. We'll also do the computer programming, we'll have workshops up here, and then there's also the outside. The, the front is a porch and it doubles as a small stage so you can have some smaller performances out there. The idea is that it is warm. The wood is all reclaimed here and downstairs, and we also use it for some of the furniture. And then the metal kind of gives it this chic look, like the natural wood with the metal. So it's supposed to make you feel like you can chill here and make music happen. So that's the Memphis Slim House, the Memphis Slim Collaboratory, but it's much more than a place where musicians and artists can come in and record and have all the tools. It's actually an economic development tool. So when you look at it, obviously originally located by Stacks, but you're building a tourist destination. You're building a place where you can have other area businesses thrive around it, and so you're building a destination. 
Talk about just that role. Sure, for us, it's a part of an uh, economic development strategy uh, that we hope will be an amenity uh, for the community that musicians who utilize the space will ultimately say they want to live near the space to fully take advantage of it, uh, as well as while they're there actually in the space, they may uh, patronize the businesses that are near it. So for us, uh, we see it in a number of ways to advance that neighborhood economically. Because I think that's going to be a draw for restaurants and stores Absolutely. and all the above. Absolutely. But you're actually taking it a step further. You're installing Wi-Fi that's going to be free for the community of Soulsville, right? Yes. Uh, this is the first uh, wireless broadband uh, infrastructure that's being established in a neighborhood context. So uh, approximately about six blocks of that community will have free Wi-Fi. So that's for the businesses as well as the homes uh, will have access. That's a game changer. Um, that's to me right now when you look at it you're working in three communities primarily but obviously the vision is to expand further what are the three communities right now the three communities are uh, Fraser uh, Binghampton and South Memphis those are the three communities that we target initially the goal is to add additional neighborhoods over time and you've had a number of success stories I mean obviously we talked about a couple but what talk about the one in Fraser uh, in Fraser, we are working uh, through a federal grant called the Building Neighborhood Capacity Program. It's in partnership with the city and a, a huge number of stakeholders uh, to work with residents as well as property owners, business owners. Uh, we've developed a kind of a cross-sector group uh, stakeholders called the Fraser Neighborhood Council. Uh, we support them in their work uh, and they have been successful in advocating uh, for about 1.6 million dollars uh, mm -hmm. renovation to the Denver Park and then some sidewalk improvements where children were having to walk to school. When you look at your work right now so much of it is focused on strategic investments. What would you say because that correlates to me over with businesses that want to make a strategic investment and looking at impact because you're you're looking at the metrics on hey does this work how can we better use this um, is this being efficient how can we make this free for the community <laughs> with the, the broadband and the wireless the Wi-Fi what would you recommend for others that are out there that say hey I want to be good stewards of my resources but I want to invest strategically in the community well we would recommend that they do that yeah, and and think about uh, using what we call uh, evidence-based or data-driven decision-making. Uh, and then the other thing that we have as a core philosophy for our organization is how do we use the private sector, the private market, as a catalyst for revitalizing neighborhoods. Uh, it's not just enough to think about how we address the social ills that may be facing these communities, but we also have to simultaneously think about how do we get the uh, economic needs addressed as well. And so that's why we take both uh, economic development approach as well as uh, community development approach. Well, I greatly appreciate you coming on and not only sharing the amazing work you're doing with Community Lift, but also too, a little bit of the strategy behind yeah. the scenes. So thank Eric, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. mission is teaching, studying, promoting civil rights and social change with the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change. I'm here with an advisory board member, Anthony Norris, who's also the board chair for Splash Mid South, and we'll talk about why that's important in just a second. But for starters, when you talk about the Hooks Institute, give us a little bit of the history. Sure. It really starts with um, Dr. Benjamin L. Hooks, who was really an icon in the civil rights mu movement. Uh, in our country and then the Hooks Institute was organized at the University of Memphis to celebrate the legacy of um, Dr. Hooks but then also to share with it uh, throughout the um, nation through documentaries, lectures that really tie to not only the historical aspects of the civil rights mo movement but also future applications in terms of tackling uh, challenging issues that face us today. Nice. And so, I mean, to your point, it's it's studying, it's research, but also, also too, it's, it's putting out all this information. And a big part of that is bringing it to life. It's activating it. So lectures and workshops, and you mentioned documentaries, um, bringing in guest speakers. But talk about the, the, the end goal. It's, it's, to me, it's using this information because when you like to talk about civil rights, it's pivotal moments. And you hear the term upstander, and it's a chance to, instead of being a bystander and kind of you know, look at it from afar, it's actually how do I take responsibility, how do I create change, and that's where that social change component comes in, is being upstanders and promoting that across all ages. Yes, upstander is a perfect wor word to describe um, Dr. Hooks. He really was, like I said, an icon, and his legacy is what we use as the standard to help share with the youth of today through academic research, lectures, but also through the application, through programming, to really reach out and show the importance of applying academic research to um, problems in the 
uh, that we face in our community so today. So in other words, it's looking at the past and giving people tools to then make good decisions and collaborate and work together for a bright future. Absolutely, <laughs> collaboration is the key. Nice. Um, so one of the programs is Splash Mid-South, and when you look at the um, Hooks Institute for Social Change, there are obviously a no number of programs that are supported, and one obviously being Splash Mid-South, and back in 2008, there was a very unfortunate incident. Talk about what happened that started the road for Splash Mid-South. Sure, it was in response to that tragic um, drowning deaths of two teenage youth. It was a call to action led by uh, Safe Kids Mid-South and Labonte Children's Hospital that really galvanized the community to come together to develop programming to provide free and low-cost swim lessons to all the children in our community. And the Hooks Institute was very instrumental in helping us document and record the uh, research data uh, with the formation of that program. Nice. So let's go ahead and let's show viewers a little bit more about Splash Mid-South. Splash Mid-South program is a wonderful um, community-based program based on national research that shows that uh, you know having a local program buy-in to uh, teaching kids how to swim is a very important issue for the entire community. The research that I did um, with USA Swimming at the national level showed over and over again that um, minority populations typically do not learn how to swim for various reasons, but mostly because of fear. There's such deep-seated fear, especially in the African-American community, um, regarding getting into a pool. Um, so many times parents discourage their kids from even going near the water because of the fear. Beginner swimmers typically just learn the basic water safety uh, information first in regards to never swim alone. You know, make sure you have a partner uh, at all times, even when they're in a lesson, they'll probably learn that. So a, a lot of the instructors do a great job of getting kids to actually put their face in the water, eventually learning how to glide in the water, learning how to float in the water, uh, and eventually leading up to the actual swimming strokes. Splash Mid-South, obviously that gives us an idea of the bringing to life, the culmination, the swim lessons, the lifeguard training, but it's so much more than that. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of analytics that went into this, um, not only in the collaboration that you're doing, but also too in why this is so important for our community. And you had some startling statistics when the Benjamin Hooks Institute did the research. What were some of those stats? Yes, uh, the research that was conducted by Dr. Carroll and Dick Irwin at the University of Memphis brought to the nation's attention that almost 70 percent of African-American youth and close to 60 percent of Hispanic youth didn't know how to swim. And that was really um, alarming and a part of the reason that we knew we had to do something about it and started our Learn to Swim and Water Safety Initiative. And so part of this is you're not only looking at best practices in terms of helping the, the trainers and the lifeguards and helping them to not only uh, be more efficient with their, their skill sets and their program, but also too looking at how do we collaborate? How do we make a dent? How do we change these numbers to be positive, correct? Yes, you can put a, you know, take one small step or you can really take a, a big picture approach. And that's what uh, we chose to do by bringing all of the leading organizations in the city with the YMCA, the city of Memphis, the University of Memphis, as well as the Hooks Institute together to really look at how do we address the root cause, educating parents, conducting research, applying that research, and then sharing that with the um, partners within the community, which has returned, um, produced a monograph, which was a chronicle of the formation of our community-wide coalition that we've shared with other communities. Is that almost like a kind of a pyramid approach in terms of the way you're, you're going about it and the impact it's having? Yes, uh, the research showed us that you really can provide water safety instruction. And so that's the base of a pyramid, but then we take it from water safety for all the children, then also learn to swim opportunities for uh, many children. Then you have developmental swim opportunities, competitive swim opportunities, and elite swim, which is where we have children that go through our program that become lifeguards, uh, swim coaches, swim instructors. We have two children in our program that are currently head coaches at swim teams here in the city. Wow, that's impressive. So when you look at it, I mean, so far over 5,000 kids, right, impacted? Yes, 5,000. While we celebrate that as a, a great accomplishment, we know that there are thousands more 
that are on waiting lists waiting to um, participate in the program. So uh, we've been very successful, but I think we um, have just really scratched the surface as the opportunities that we have in our community. And I think it is pretty neat because obviously it made all the big headlines, but you've had some big wins like bringing Colin Jones, the Olympian here to Memphis, right? Yes, that was something that was really exciting. The entire um, Memphis area came together uh, and participated in the contest with USA Swimming, and we won the Cullen Jones, who's the uh, African-American um, Olympic gold medalist that came to Memphis and, and uh, celebrated with us. So we feel that we're on the right track, and a lot of it was through the support that we get through the Hooks Institute and their research. Well, I know it's a, a bad analogy, but the reality is by focusing in on this, this is a great example where the rising tide lifts all ships. And so for what you're doing, you're tremendously helping the whole Mid-South community by focusing in on, you know, using the resources and, and focusing in on swimming, but really doing it in a way that provides free or very low cost for those families that this is important and it's a need. So greatly appreciate you coming on the show and sharing everything you're doing with Splash Mid-South and also the Benjamin Hooks Institute for Social Change. Thank you very much. When we talk about making a difference in the community, the spark comes from you, people helping people. But it can also come from schools, churches, nonprofits, and corporations. Something that stood out in this month's episode is the powerful synergy created when your mission and expertise aligns with that of a partner organization and program. Baker Donaldson is using its legal expertise and resources as a catalyst to give back, promoting civil rights and social change, as well as strategic investment. Their involvement with Community Lift is helping to revitalize neighborhoods and make our city an even greater place to live, work, play, and raise our families. With the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change and Splash Mid-South, they're also helping to teach youth the safety and enjoyment of swimming. As we see each month, what makes our community so special is that so many individuals and organizations are stepping up to make a difference. So thank you for watching The Spark. To learn more about each of the guests and to interact with your stories of others leading by example, visit thesparktv.org. We look forward to seeing you next month, and we hope you'll join with us in creating a spark for the Mid-South. Just like having the right information is necessary to make solid hiring and lending decisions, being engaged in our community is important. Datafax is proud to support the positives and be a presenting sponsor of the Spark. State Systems is focused on protecting life and property. As a local, privately owned company, our foundation was built on providing all businesses with complete fire and security protection and infrastructure cabling. State Systems is proud to be a part of the Mid-South community and the presenting sponsor of The Spark. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance has been serving the Mid-South since 1954. We've always focused on supporting our community and believe in promoting the positives, encouraging engagement, and leading by example. Lipscomb and Pitts is proud to be a presenting sponsor of The Spark.